Hi, everyone. Uh, today, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, an IDE setup that I came up with for kernel development. And uh, because it's a um, difficult topic, I wanted to start with a disclaimer. <laughs> uh, so this is not a war. I know there's an editor war, and I'm not here to feed the troll, um, to be entirely um, um, fair. Uh, there's a lot of problem with VS Code. It's an ID written in, type, in a TypeScript. Uh, it's not something I particularly like, but it's very cool. It's very powerful. And uh, in the end, I, I could come up with a setup that is so powerful that I uh, ditched my VI habits and I started to use uh, VS Code. Um, so yeah, why am I giving this talk? Or why am I building this thing? Uh, originally, it was to lower the bar to entry. Uh, my team was going to have interns. And we didn't want our interns to spend half of their time uh, setting up some environments, some tools, and uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so I started to hack on something and see how far I could go. And um, yeah, it worked pretty well for the interns. They said a lot of time. I realized it was pretty cool, so I started to use it myself. Then my teammates started to say, hey, uh, can I use it as well? Uh, so we also have uh, VI users, a Max veteran in my team who switched to VS Code. Uh, and then people across the company started to reach out and say, hey, I stumbled upon this and it's really cool. Can I use it? Uh, until um, Nick reached out and asked if I could present it. So I, I open sourced it. Uh, so now it's all available on uh, my GitHub. And um, hopefully you'll be interested in it. Uh, yeah, so one benefit I found uh, with this setup was that uh, it improved the reproducibility of uh, the setup. Uh, so, for example, I work a lot these days on syscaller bugs, and I find that uh, people complain a lot, oh, syscaller bug doesn't reproduce on my setup because I'm using this and that and that. Uh, but having this sort of reference setup that everybody likes to use makes it easier to say, well, this is how you set it up. Uh, and then I have sort of a philosophical point about uh, <laughs> the Unix philosophy of do one thing and do it uh, uh, well. Uh, I find that the, the reason why the Unix philosophy is so effective of uh, uh, tools that do one thing and do it well is because of interoperability. So if you have I don't know, less, um, ls, grep, find, whatever, uh, they are really so powerful because you can pipe one into the other and they sort of all work together. So I wanted to take this as a design um, idea and uh, see how far we could get with integrating all these tools we have together. But yeah, first, mention for all the tools we have and that are great. Uh, um, so I'll scan for a bunch of tools that exist and you probably use already. And uh, all of the tools I'm going to mention, they are all integrated in the VS Code setup I will demo afterward. Uh, so I said I uh, split them in different sort of categories. And the first topic I want to talk about is the mailing list tools. Um, so if you want to send something to the list, most likely you're going to use Git format patch. Uh, maybe you set up a cover letter and you want to edit it. And I know that Git has some features for this, but I find lots of people, what they do is they spin up VI, they modify the cover letter locally. <laughs> and uh, so on. Then you probably want to run check patch. Um, you want to see uh, who to send it to, so you're going to use get, get, get maintainers, and then git send email. And um, to highlight one of the interoperability issue that I see is, uh, for example, the output of get maintainers is uh, human readable, but uh, uh, you have to sort of copy paste the email addresses into git send email, which is always taking a bit of time. And uh, I found that it caused a great deal of anxiety with my colleagues. So <laughs> actually, often my colleagues would uh, pull me in and say, hey, can you triple check my git send email command? Because I'm so afraid to do something wrong. And if the email is not, if I forget someone, or blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah. Other tools we have, uh, law. Um, law is kind of cool. Archives all the uh, emails. Uh, it's this kind of old UI. It's maybe sometimes a bit hard to read, uh, but it's great we have it. Uh, patchwork, lots of subsystems also um, index their patches with patchwork because that's sort of more modern UI. They can assign people, they can uh, uh, set the state of review. Um, and patchwork has pretty nice APIs that you can interact with. So I'll get back to this later in the demo, but um, yeah. Lots of people have MUT or some email client setup. Uh, everybody has different setups. Some people have a uh, lay, lay, I don't know how it's pronounced, uh, other things. Uh, before, it's amazing. I think before is really great. It's sort of an inspiration for the direction of the, this talk, how you can take these different steps and try to integrate them, and then you get uh, value from the combination of all these tools. Uh, yeah, so a bunch of tools that are pretty new, nice. Now I want to talk a little bit about build tools. 
so in the domain of uh, building, we have uh, just the config generation, of course, they've config. But um, again, I, I stopped counting how many times colleagues will come to me and say, oh, my bug doesn't reproduce anymore. What's the problem? And um, turns out they, were, they keep copy pasting the, def, the config they've been using for four years uh, because they are too afraid to regenerate it from scratch because it's the one config they know run in their VM. And if they regenerate it, it will not run in the VM. So sort of a sane setup to generate a config file. That's, that's quite cool. Uh, make. What could be possibly change in make, right? Well, everybody I know has a wrapper for make that uses the maximum number of CPU because it's so annoying to type make dash j something something. Uh, we have Ccache as well, which is quite a cool tool. Uh, I found that uh, most people I know don't use Ccache. And quite some people I know who use Ccache actually have it misconfigured. And uh, basically, every time they try to generate an object, the timestamp is different. So the cache misses. And Ccache only has cache misses. And it's completely pointless. Uh, so having a setup that has Ccache integrated, which works, is very cool. <laughs> uh, Clang. Uh, so the question for maybe for the recording is uh, someone was told to not use Ccache because it might interfere with, with the kernel. Uh, possibly. I haven't had any issue myself. So maybe. don't know. Uh, Clank, this is a toolchain track. So lots of people know there's a lot of value in LVM. What I, The most value I find in LLVM is all the ecosystem that comes with it. For example, I really like Clank format. Well, you don't really necessarily have to buy into Clank to use Clank format, but still. Uh, I don't have to think about how to format my patches anymore. I just, just ask Clang Format to deal with this for me. Just remove some mental burden from contributing to the list. And uh, the, the star of the night, Clang D. Uh, so Clang D is this daemon that um, knows how to parse your files because it uses the same compiler front end as Clang and it has the same compiler arguments as Clang. And, uh, and it serves a language server protocol so that your ID can query Clang D and ask for types, information, users of functions, blah, blah, blah. And uh, ClangD is really a key part of the setup I'm going to present. Uh, Cross-compile. <laughs> uh, it sounds easy. It sounds like there's not much to it. But um, it's so easy to type make cross-compile equals ARM64 J32. Make cross-compile equals ARM64 dev config. And then one day you forget and you just type make menu config. And now it will default to x86 and mess up your, your config file. And ah, you have to start over. So there's so many ways to shoot yourself in the foot. Another domain of tools <laughs> where we have a lot of stuff again, and they sort of all work independently, uh, virtual machines. So I, I've been working in a few different companies. And uh, it's been so interesting to see that everybody has a wrapper for QMU. Everybody has a wrapper for Debootstrap. Um, and um, you will be happy to know I came up with yet another one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so what do we have here? Uh, well, debootstrap as an example of something to generate a rootfs, but some, I don't know some people use build root or anything. Really. QMU. So QMU is, is uh, of course amazing, but uh, the command line of QMU is uh, difficult to remember. <laughs> so um, um, yeah, everybody comes up with that. The one shell script that wraps it. Uh, GDB, I, th I think there's so much value in using GDB for kernel development, but from what I can see around me, most people do not use GDB just because it's a bit annoying to set up, so uh, it's easier to just print K and reboot the machine and see what happens. Uh, symbolized backtrace, yeah, if you have a kernel backtrace, you have all these uh, addresses, offsets, they are hard-coded, hard to read. Um, people may or may not know that they can actually have line numbers. Uh, and personally, I always forget which script it is and the tools that does it. So uh, I often share backtraces that are just hexadecimal addresses and are pretty useless. Uh, and then other tools that uh, are pretty nice to have in a VM. So I don't know if you generate your VM nicely, you have probably SSH access into it, but maybe you want to easily throw it into your VM image. Maybe you want to have some shared directory with the VM, with 9PFS, blah, 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 blah. Okay, and I'm not even done. <laughs> um, so more categories of tools that people come up with, uh, automate what I call automation. Let's say you are working on a new kernel feature, you probably introduce a new syscall or something, and you want to have a fast iteration cycle where you reboot your machine, and every time you reboot your machine, you want to run your stimulus that will just call your syscall. Uh, so you don't have to log in and type a command. And, um, so some sort of auto start every time the machine reboots. 
uh, depending on your subsystem, if you're lucky, you have self-tests. <laughs> they are amazing. And uh, But yeah, sometimes a bit cumbersome to build, to run, so on. Oof, it's a long list. Huh? <laughs> uh, other categories of tools, if you want to share a link to someone, uh, you have this, your file number, file and line number, but maybe they are on a different branch and you want to have like maybe a sigit.kernel.org link. Uh, so there's some tools for this. And what I call interactive workflows. Uh, I'm going to take the example of sysbot bugs only. Um, so I deal a lot with um, syscolor, but syscolor bugs. And uh, the process is always the same. You go to the page, you find the line that you're interested in, you download the .config, you check out the commit, you download the reproducer, you build the reproducer, you push it in your VM, you run it. All these sort of things uh, that would be cool to automate. Okay, enough of the existing tools. Um, let's see what I could come up, what I could uh, sort of integrate in a, a VS Code setup. And let's see if I can share my screen. That's the big. Uh, the malls. Yes, it is working. Amazing. Uh, is there a way to make it bigger? Uh, Just see. It's, I don't know which cursor is your cursor, but there's that. I think I can't reach that one. No. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, maybe the controls in the back of the room might be able to maximize the screen. This one? No. <laughs> Oh, yeah, there we go. Perfect. Thank you. Amazing. Cool. Uh, okay, so let's start with the mailing list workflow. I'm going to work on a feature um, and just create a, a branch. And um, yeah, the, the thing I've been uh, uh, waiting for for a long time is that fork will be more verbose, right? We, that's what we all miss, right? So let's just add the print K to fork. And uh, that's going to be my patch. That's what I want to push the list. Uh, so to create commits, to be entirely honest with you, I always use the terminal because it's nicer to use git commit. But uh, for the benefit of the demonstration, I'm sure you can also do it from Git's code. Uh, make for create again. More print k. Okay. okay. All right. So now I have my branch. I have my commit, and I want to send it to the list. Well, you're in luck. I wrote an extension called git send email. <laughs> and um, what it does is it remembers a bunch of parameters for your branch. Uh, so here you have a LPC 23 branch. And uh, you can set some uh, flags for the, for the mail you want to send. So for example, a subject prefix. We're going to start with an RFC because I'm not quite sure about this, if this will fly on the list. And I don't want to sound pretentious. Uh, so RFC v1, uh, let's add a cover letter. Uh, print k. Verbose print k and um, make uh, print k more verbose. All right, uh, so I can select how many patches I want integrated in the series, but I just need one. Uh, I can inspect it quickly. So if I click, click, click on the patch, I can see the patch. Uh, and now I can use the magic wand to call get maintainers. And get maintainers will uh, return me all the uh, emails that I uh, want to to or CC. Uh, give it a second. It's a bit longer for CCs because there's a bunch of people who are interested in fork.c. Okay, and uh, yeah, actually, I will not email these people. <laughs> um, so let's remove them all. And let's use the other button here. Uh, so this one actually parses the maintainers file and knows everyone in there. Uh, so let's find me in the uh, maintainers file and let's just email me. Um, so you have a bunch of additional uh, cool options that are useful when you work on a series. For example, okay, here we only have one patch, but uh, an interactive rebase is something that I, I find myself running all the time for the patches I have in my series. And I don't know about you, but what I do is I do git rebase dash i head tilde 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 tilde, and then I remove two tilde because there was two two more. Um, yeah. So this one, this tool knows how many patches you have in your series. So uh, yeah. You can also inspect the world series with the uh, cover letter and uh, before sending it. You can run check patch. Uh, so it will generate all your patches and uh, run check patch. And for example, here, print k should include kernel level. Bah, doesn't matter. I just ignore it. Okay, and then when you're ready to send it, uh, you have the big blue button. 
uh, and um, I always insist that it's a safe button. It only generates a command for you. It doesn't actually press enter. So you can still deal with your anxiety, uh, looking at the terminal and uh, opening the file, making sure that everything is okay. And when you're ready, press enter. Yes. And yes. And then send. Yes. Wait, gets better. <laughs> Um, so actually, it found the, the patches I sent. It, it, because it controls the terminal, it finds the message IDs in there. And uh, it remembers them. So if you, if you click on one of the previously sent series, what is going to happen is going to search for it on Patchwork. If it finds it, it will just open it on Patchwork. If not, it will open it on Law. Well, this time we didn't CC any mailing list, so it won't actually uh, find it on Law, but uh, it, it would if, you, if it was archived. Uh, and now, let's say I got some reviews and I want to bump the series. I can just uh, bump the series. And now I got my LPC23 v2 branch uh, bumped with to v2. And it still remembers my uh, previous term. So I can still find my history of law links because um, finding my previous submission is also something I always struggle with, like, ah, which, which was v2, v, v3, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, plus, it knows the history between the, the link between all the branches. So you get an extra button now, like range diff, which lets you compare the current branch with the previous branch. And then you can see what changed between your V2 and V1 branch, uh, all automatically from the click of a button. That's very nice when you need to say what changed since V1, this and that. Okay, so that was the sending path. Now let's see about the receiving path. So I wrote another extension uh, called the Patchwork extension. And uh, as you might imagine, it integrates with Patchwork. Uh, so this is the, a series of, uh, this is a um, list of patches that were recently sent to the list. And uh, if you open just a random one, uh, you can inspect the patch here. And uh, so Patchwork has a pretty advanced metadata extraction from, uh, from, from the patches it finds on law. Uh, so actually, um, I can really render the, the diffs nicely in a two pane diff. You can also um, have links to the local files. And uh, you can do things like reply. Uh, if you just click reply, what it does is it will just download the, the content of the patch and generates a, a nice um, inbox, uh, which you can send with two commands. Um, so it's quite straightforward. You can just uh, type from the comfort of your ID and re reply to the list right here. Save. Uh, so that was just a single patch, but uh, it also works with series. Like here, we have um, a, a series. There's going to be a cover letter. Of course, it doesn't load. Demo effect. Doesn't matter. You have to believe me. And uh, the patches of the series. Uh, the question was, does it use MUT for sending the, image, the emails? No, it doesn't. Uh, it just uses uh, kit send email. Uh, or actually, it doesn't use anything. It just generates an inbox for you, and it gives you a nice header at the top uh, that explains that if you run these two commands, that will send email. And the first command strips off the, this very header, and the second command just uses git send email. So as long as you have git send email set up, it will work fine. Uh, well, uh, you can filter things out. Uh, so let's say uh, you are interested in NetDev. Uh, you can filter by NetDev. Uh, and let's say you want to stalk me uh, because my patches are very interesting. So you can also uh, filter by me. I find that stalking people is tremendously useful because let's say I know that this one kernel kind of developer works on a feature I care a lot about. And I want to know if they renamed the feature to something else because maintainers ask that it gets renamed something else. And uh, here I can just see the history of uh, recent work from someone. And I can also know if they are slacking off on my feature by working on something else. Uh, right. And uh, maybe one thing I, I didn't show is also you have the whole conversations uh, log in a, a tree here. And log links. Uh, so yeah. All right. I think, oh, and you can also save filters. So if you, let's say you like this filter of uh, me on VPF, you can just save this filter and get back to it later. later. Right. Now let's talk about uh, building. Um, so I'm going to use the Control Shift B shortcut, which is um, a, a standard shortcut. Uh, there's a question here. Remote, 
Um, so some of my workflow around patchwork does involve pulling down the patch and testing that patch locally. So I can provide test design. So do you also have an integration for that? Thank you very much. I forgot to mention something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was exactly the question I had because as soon as I'm going through my whatever subsystem I'm using view for, or in, in this case it's GOC, but still I'm looking at kernel code and I'm looking at C library code, I'm pulling and then usually passing patch stuff to the test. So I intend to use uh, PW client or GPW basically, but I'd love to not, and I'd love to be able to have interns do something like this. So, uh, so what do you do for that? Right, so if you have a patch or a series open here, like look at a series, for example, here, uh, you can just click on the apply series button, and what it will do, it will, it will download the patches and git AM them. Um, it would be nice if it were also trying to infer the base and maybe creating another branch. Right now, it's a bit simple, it just applies them, uh, but I'm hoping to improve it uh, if people start to use it. Okay, yeah. another question? I saw in your slide you mentioned view forward, and in your workflow you're using like just like raw git send email and pulling stuff down from patchwork, and it looks really clean, really refined. View forward does a lot of this as well. I was wondering if your extension integrates at all, because I really like how view forward will get the maintainers for you and format your patch and do the cover series folding, and it will also fetch trailers, and I find that really nice to use. Uh, but that also looks great to you. So I was wondering if there's a nice crossover with view forward there. That's a very good question, actually. Uh, does this use before? It does not. Um, I think the reason why I did not use before, even though I think before is amazing, is because um, the way I named this extension is patchwork and kids and email is sort of like a generic across different projects. And um, I'm not sure if before is kernel specific or works with, let's say, QMU or Mesa or any other project that uses patchwork. So I, I scoped my extensions in a broader perspective. Uh, that being said, I, I'm also very open to having conditional features. Like for example, in Git send email, the the magic wand to use Git maintainer, Git maintainer is only available if you have a Git maintainer PL script in your workspace. So let's say if you are working on something else and you don't have Git maintainer, the thing will just not be there. So I, I guess I could also have something that if you have before, then you will use before and you will get all the amazing features that before has. Okay, uh, back to what I was saying about uh, now the build. Um, so yeah, uh, there's a standard shortcut uh, in uh, um, VS Code, uh, Command Shift B, that just builds. And uh, what happens there is it, run, it runs one, well, what, what they call tasks. And uh, tasks are just uh, um, commands. Uh, so I have a mega bash script that implements all the tasks. And it's very simple because it's just bash. You can read it. And uh, it's straight to the point. So it does very simple things like check if you have a dot config. If you don't, then it will generate one for you. Uh, we missed a step because uh, we did other things. But basically, it generates one with uh, make dev config, make KVM guests so it runs well in the VM, and uh, it enables debug dwarf. And then it will also run make. Uh, and then by default, it will uh, enable, use all your CPUs. It will use um, LLVM. It will use Ccache. <laughs> and it will generate a compile command to JSON file. <coughs> what is compile command to JSON? I hear you ask. Um, so compile command to JSON associates all C files in your tree with commands. So it's just a log, essentially, of every call to Clang or GCC that was uh, generated by make. What that means is that ClangD can parse this file and knows if you're trying to um, uh, open this file. So let, let's just open this file. Uh, ClangD knows which are the configurations you had enabled uh, or uh, what are the include paths and everything. So it can gray out the paths that are not built and it can also resolve precisely the configuration you have. So for example, here, if we look at syscall table and we uh, look up syscall table, we end up literally on the syscall table definition we're using in this build. And uh, it's very cool because from what I could see a lot of uh, developers, what they do is they, they use um, so something like grep. Uh, so this this will be the equivalent of grep, where you just search for syscall table and these are all the hits in the, in the code base and you'll find, oh, this is for alpha. So no, I'm not using alpha. This is for arc, I'm not using arc and so on. So you really find uh, 
symbols for your build. Um, what else? Maybe that's it for build. I have a list. I sorry, I have notes with everything I'm supposed to talk about, and I will just uh, make sure I didn't forget anything. Yes, I did forget something. Uh, so another thing that's pretty cool about this setup is that, um, as I say, tasks are implemented in a script uh, called task.sh. Uh, and one of the things it does is uh, it sets up some environment variables, and then it source, sources a file called local.sh. And in local.sh, you can put whatever you want. Uh, there's, there's a question here. A uh, question about the compile commands. Do you have any scripting or um automation to generate the compile commands. When I've played around with Clang D, that was my single biggest hurdle. It's intrigue right now. Scripts, Clang, gen, compile commands. For wow. stuff that is not in tree, or if your tree is slightly different, say you're using uh, sparse trees where you don't even necessarily have the entire thing. I, I have not played around with it. So the in tree script is the best answer at this point is what I'm hearing. If you're in tree, use gen compile commands. If you're out of tree, doing your own thing, try bear. B E A. B E A. All right, cool. Thanks. So I actually have a similar problem. I have I work on a branch that doesn't have, uh, make compile commands to JSON, and what I do is I just extract the 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 gen compile command Python script uh, with git show. Uh, from a branch that has it, and then I, I just run it, and uh, and it works even if you are on an old kernel tree. Uh, anyway, um, yeah. So I was saying you we test the SH implements all the commands. It sources a local SH, and there you can have your local configuration. For example, you may choose to cross compile for ARM64, and now everything everything I'm going to talk about will work for ARM64. That's not just compilation, but that's also cross debugging. That's also emulation. Uh, and anything else I can think about now. Um, all right. So now let's talk about virtual machines. Uh, so I showed the first uh, shortcut, uh, Control Shift B. Now the, the second shortcut you need to remember is uh, F5. Uh, so F5 is a, also the standard shortcut in VS Code to um, um, run your target. Uh, you can, of course, change all these shortcuts, but um, I just want to say this, this integrates with how VS Code is supposed to work, and if you if you change your shortcuts, it will work for all projects. Um, so I intentionally deleted my uh, rootfs, my guest rootfs, just to demonstrate the generation of a new rootfs. But uh, what happened here is that the setup noticed, oh, you don't have a rootfs. Let me create uh, an X4 partition, and let me inflate uh, Debian in it with uh, dbootstrap. Actually, mm depthstrap because I found that it works a lot more reliably than dbootstrap. Um, so yeah, it takes a second, and um, now I need to keep you entertained for five seconds. Uh, I don't know what to do. Dance, <laughs> sing, no. Uh, yeah, my single skills are not very <laughs> on point. Uh, it's actually relatively fast, but uh, yeah, for example, when I say that uh, if you if you set target arch arm64, it will also generate a cross image for arm64. Okay, got five seconds from the same sense. <laughs> and um, anyway, when, once it's done generating the image, uh, what it will do is it will use a mechanism called auto start. Uh, so, as part of the setup, uh, there's an auto start directory that contains three things uh, an auto start systemd service, an auto start.c, and an auto start.sh. So here it noticed that auto start is not in the image, so only then it will actually open open the rootfs and install auto start in it, and then it boots. Uh, so it's quite fast because it's on x86 on x86, so it's using KVM, and uh, the whole thing is set up such that um, you you are directly logged in. You already have um, uh, no, your root terminal, and uh, you can do other things like um, SSH into it, SSHing into it. Uh, so that's another task, and uh, here I have another terminal on the, in, a, in the virtual machine. Um, one thing that's also pretty cool is that by default, it will always run with a debugger attached. Um, so without you noticing anything, this run, uh, this run under mm -hmm. GDB. So now if I um, post the VM, uh, I have uh, backtraces on all CPUs. Oh. And I can inspect uh, the local registers and uh, variables, if there were variables, but there's nothing. I can single step. 
uh, and so on. I can set breakpoints, remove them, blah, blah, blah. Um, more things. Um, yeah, so I said there were, there were many tasks. Uh, for example, some of the tasks are shooting into the virtual machine. Uh, so if you if you do not have your guest kernel running, you can still choose to shoot into it and modify the file system and adjust things. Uh, and again, this works cross architecturally. So actually, if you're shooting into NORM64 uh, rootfs, you will also use uh, QMU static to run the binaries and everything runs transparently. Cool. Uh, let's see. That is enough for VMs. Now, yes, I was mentioning actually um, automation, auto start. So this auto start uh, uh, file you can modify, and there's also an auto start uh, sh. So if you want to run a stimulus, uh, which is more of a syscall kind from C, or if you want to run more of a CFS uh, write from Bash, you can just modify these uh, uh, these files, and then the next time you run a VM. It will notice they changed. It will push them in the VM, boot the VM, and then at the end of the boot, you can see they run. So it's quite useful. Uh, for example, to reproduce this color bug, you can just iterate super fast. You just press F5 and the whole thing runs. Um, we provide other tasks for um, self tests. For example, I work a lot on VPF, so you can run VPF self tests. It's also integrated. Um, another feature. I have a lot of things to say. <laughs> I hope you're dealing with it. Uh, there's a bit of Git, Git integration here. And uh, one of the things that I find super cool is the, the blame at the end of the line. Uh, so often, documentation is sort of lacking in the kernel. But you find that the, the commit that introduced the, the line is super helpful. It has really good context. So here, you can just over, over line. And um, you can see the, the patch description that introduced the line. And I find this, this saved me a bunch of time with really good context. Um, another thing I want to share is um, how you can just generate um, uh, Seagit links. So this is the content of my uh, copy paste direct, uh, copy paste buffer. Uh, if you go in the right copy as, uh, you can just generate a Seagit link that links to the right file at the right commit and at the right line number. It's very useful to share code with someone. Oh, Flora, yeah. let's say in your make, make fork great again, Change. Let's say I uh, my messed up my indentation. I use space instead of tabs. Very good question as well. Uh, so let's say you have messed up your indentation and you've used spaces instead of tab. So you get live squiggles from check patch. Uh, so here you can see code indent should use tabs where possible from check patch. Uh, so you yeah you have live um, check patch. You don't have to wait until the end and before, until you run check patch. And on that topic. Also something I forgot to mention. <laughs> um, because we are using Clang D, we also get live squiggles from Clang. So as you type your code, you get uh, um, uh, basically compilation errors. And even better, you have compilation quick fixes. So um, like the cool kids who do Java in some modern IDs, now you can just say, apply quick fix, and ta-da, which is amazing. Hey, nice. <laughs> uh, can I get a question? Then? Yeah. Yeah, so I think uh, VS Code is one of the only editors with like first class copilot support. So is copilot writing all of your patches? <laughs> um, and how does that integrate into the workflow? Can so, it write my patch descriptions for me? Uh, so the cool thing about VS Code is you can install a lot of uh, extensions. Uh, so you have this extension tab and you can install a bunch. And this setup comes with a bunch of recommendation like device tree, kconfig, uh, VI, uh, no, this one installed myself, x86 <laughs> and uh, assembly and a bunch of stuff. But um, uh, it doesn't recommend any of these AI code generation tool. Uh, you could play with them. I haven't played with them myself. I believe for kernel development, they are maybe not as, um, um, uh, let's say, advanced as they would be for uh, stuff where Stack Overflow is well, um, <laughs> has a lot of information. So like, let's say, if you write Python, probably works well. If you write kernel code, probably doesn't know about your subsystem. I assume. But play with it, please. And let me know how it goes. I'm interested. And I have one last thing to show. Um, so VS Code has really good, really good integration for um, notebooks. Uh, 
so if you're not familiar with notebooks, these are sort of like documents where you can mix text and code. And uh, I provide a couple of uh, reference notebooks. Uh, one is for Sysbot bug reproduction, as I said, I care a lot about this. Uh, so the idea is you can just provide the URL of your bug and then you can iteratively, uh, you can interactively run all the cells. So you can just do run all and what it will do is, is we'll download the Sysbot page, we'll parse it, it will ask you for the crash you want to reproduce, you will check out the commits, uh, check out, get the config, build for you. Um, you will download the reproducer, build it, push it, run it. And uh, there's no hidden magic. You can see how everything is implemented. There's no crazy layer of abstraction. Uh, you can just uh, dive into test.sh and see how everything works. All right, that I think was it for the demo. Um, so how does it work? Um, the reason why I want to talk a little bit about how the setup works is because I want to show there's no uh, dark magic. It's very simple. You can modify it. And um, that helped a lot of people to adopt it because they realized, oh, that's just a bash script. So how to install it? Um, you just have to clone this .vs code directory under your kernel tree. And essentially, that's it. Uh, you should run the update task once because it generates a file that uh, maybe I could uh, do in the default git uh, repository, but um, yeah, I, I need to think more about it. Uh, meaning that the world setup is a uh, version with Git. You can Git pull it, you can fork it. It's just a Git repository. So, And everything is under .vs code. So it's as simple as that. Uh, you can also update it, which is basically Git pull, uh, but uh, it does a few things to make sure you will never get any conflict. Because if you, as long as you modify your local .sh, you will never get any conflict. Uh, so what's in there? Um, briefly, so VS Code understands these JSON files. Uh, one is extensions.json. These are just recommendation of extensions uh, that the setup thinks you should want. Uh, you can choose to ignore it if you don't want these extensions. extensions. Uh, but for example, that includes the patchwork extension, the git send email extension, and uh, let's say uh, language support and so on. There's one that describes how to run uh, the VM with a debugger. So you can choose, for example, to run the VM and as soon as possible, attach a debugger. You can to choose to attach a debugger to a running VM, or you can choose to start a VM, wait for the debugger to attach, and then continue. Uh, settings provide a bunch of uh, default settings. Uh, for example, a sort of like code linting options or options to ignore all sorts of um, temporary files. So you know if, if you grep through your kernel tree and you find that 80% of the hits are temporary files, and um, like these are filtered out by default with the setup, so you don't have to think about it. And tasks.json associates um, commands, which just have a nice name, to um, bash commands, so executions of the tasks.sh script. So yeah, all the actual magic happens here. It's just this tasks.sh script. Um, it sets up a bunch of environment variables, look, uh, sources the local .sh, where you can override some of these environment variables. And then it's just a huge uh, switch case. And depending on the RPG one, it will just do different things. So it might run make, it might run make dev config, or blah, blah, blah. Uh, notebooks are just notebooks. There's not much to say. <laughs> I only showed you the Sysbot one. I have another one for Lisa, which is this framework from ARM, uh, which is kind of cool. It can uh, SSH into, into some target. And then it basically extracts ftrace uh, data as a pandas data frame. So then you can do data analysis with this and, and so on. Uh, so the setup also comes with this and it's pre-configured for the SSH port that is set up by default by the VM and so on. So everything just works. And then how to start, I also showed you, it's just this C file, this SSH file and this system service. And that's all I had. Uh, so thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please. Any questions? Do we have any questions or perhaps feature uh, have, feature requests for the speaker? I have lots of feature requests. Oh, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah. How much of what you've written would work outside of VS Code? Um, ah, that's also a very good question. And another thing I forgot to mention. Um, so as I said, a lot of the magic is uh, our calls to task.sh with a specific argument, like task.sh, start, task.sh, SSH. As the SH, stop, push, pull, shoot, whatever. Uh, so actually, you can just have an alias 
in your bash rc or wherever you want uh, to test the sh and then any command there you can run from a terminal anywhere um so yeah uh, specifically eyeballing the integration you have with i don't know if it was lore or patchwork but pulling down ah. different revisions and um specifically like tracking across multiple versions of the same series to see how it's evolved. Uh, does your tooling lend itself to that or is that something else entirely? Not at all. These are, um, if you want really a full good control over the VS Code UI, you need to buy into this VS Code ecosystem of, of extensions. You need to write them in TypeScript and uh, you have access to nice APIs, but it's highly VS Code specific. Okay. And for example, it uses APIs uh, to store workspace specific information, branch specific information. So I, I don't see how you could access it outside of VS Code, unfortunately. Uh, B4 has some similar features outside of uh, VS Code, but not identical, I think. Uh, one, one other thing I wanted to ask is uh, how quickly do those compile test cycles tend to happen? Have you considered using slightly scary things like user mode Linux to uh, have a quick way of checking things still compile and at least boot? That's also a super interesting question. Um, I would love to dive more into it, but I, I try to take a non-opinionated approach to kernel development and stick to the basics of probably you're using devconfig, probably you're just using a vanilla Debian, probably you're just stick with a normal setup. Um, so I haven't really played too much with uh, exotic use cases where you know that, uh, or let's say, um, I think playing with uh, is it KUnit. Uh, yeah. KUnit has amazing features as well that I would really like to play with. Uh, I haven't really had the chance because my work doesn't. Uh... So you showed in one of the configs you could set target arch equals ARM64, yep. uh, challenge, <laughs> try target arch equals UM. And try to get that working, and I think that'll oh, yeah. make David happy. That's, that's a uh, feature request. A lot of times, I like these user space images that we're going to boot in a VM. It's a pain when you want to add things into them, and maybe you can SS, you can SCP them in now if you have SSH. That's so, so nice. There's already, there's already that. You already have test SSH push, test yep. SSH pull, and uh, well, true. Because like a common thing is I want to put these KOs of these yep. modules like into the VM or something like that, and. Um, there's another like, thing I forgot to show as well. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, so from within the VM, you have a slash host mount yep. by default, and you can access your host Perfect. from the VM. Beautiful. That's really uh, nice. So it's using 9PFS. There was a pretty interesting talk today about VertMeNG, uh, where I, I, I look more into this when I have time. Uh, but uh, yeah, you, you have. They, they talk a lot about. Are there this. issues though, where like if the if the guest wasn't configured with those drivers, it just like it's broken, and no one knows why. Yeah, like, so the reason why I stick with 9PFS is because make dev config enables 9PFS. Hmm. So you don't have to do any weird... Um, uh, but like the user any... could have done like a RAND config and 9PFS <laughs> has been turned off. And then exactly. they're like, why is if it not you, working? If, if you disable a bunch of things, you might start to miss yeah. some features. But it's like saying, yeah, I disable net and now SSH doesn't work. Or, or... Yeah, <laughs> I just wish there was like some better way of it telling me like, yo, you forgot to turn on this config. Yeah, that, that's something we could probably do. Um, I for Linux users in general, for every driver. Yeah. It's also okay. a, a difficult cursor to keep between. Uh, I want to keep this setup simple so yeah. that people feel comfortable that there's no, not too much layers of abstraction that uh, hides where the features are happening. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's difficult to be a bit opinionated, but not too much. <laughs> so, I have a uh, very uh, basic question. Uh, usually, that uh, there's, we send a series of parties, and uh, sometimes there are those. For example, ten uh, patches, but the second uh, second patch has uh, something like uh, wrong thing, uh, bugs or something like that. And uh, in that case, that the uh, next patch, I need to uh, only update that the second one. Can I? Uh, how can I do that? Um, so, do you want to change the um, what is it called the uh, prefix, the subject prefix, or what is no, it? No, no, just uh, uh, what's it that are the code? Are there are some uh, the issues? Yes. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. I, I, it's also something that I find myself doing all the time. And uh, currently, with the extension I showed, you have this um, um, interactive rebase. And what I do is I just do interactive rebase, edit the one patch I'm interested in, and uh, that's how I do it. But um, it's true. It's so common. Such a thing I would really like to improve. Yeah. <clears throat> 
Yeah, um, about, I guess, this topic. Uh, I use a lot of StackGit, and it helps a lot to, well, it, it's kind of a Git rebase and directive, uh, but much more powerful, but uh, quicker to, to get to the point. Um, so that would be really nice to have a, such an integration with your set of tools. And um, so we, we talk about uh, UML. Uh, I use both uh, Vita machines and UML, just some kind of features. And one thing I find really useful uh, with UML is that you can well, rely on the HostFS, HostFS file system. So this way, um, well, I have a script, which is on GitHub, actually. And so it enables you to uh, run your own kernel with the exact uh, file system you're running on your on the host, kind of, and it's really quick. So it's really easy to run any cell test or whatever, just running the same con that will you will run on your host. So yeah, that might also be an uh, result. Um, I think that's the approach that Vertmi takes to, to reuse the host file system. Um, actually, quite interestingly, today on this Vertmi ng talk. The, the speaker talked about some issues they had with uh, running systemd because systemd keeps some state in the file system and when you run systemd again on the same file system it finds that it's already running and it freaks out yeah um so i find it easier to have an isolated system on which i can install all sorts of crazy garbage. Yeah. Um, so and, actually and then, yeah I, I i well kind of uh we learned the host system to run the command. And uh, so for instance, if on your host system, you have systemd, uh, it kind of use the systemd units. And most of the case, it works uh, because systemd detects that it, it's running on a kind of virtual environment. So, yeah. OK. Can I have time for one more question? OK. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, hi. Yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> So uh, what's your experience when editing header files with uh, VS Code and ClangD? Uh, in my experience, if your project does not use like strict include, it, include what you use, it's just get a lot of squealy lines. And... Yeah, it's also a very good question uh, because ClangD knows how to pass a file from a command line and C, that's really how C works, right? Um, if you write an ink file, something that you intend to be included from somewhere else and um, the File that includes this will have extra uh, define or extra uh, include, then ClangD will get confused and not, not know how to pass the file. So it happens sometimes. Um, I didn't come here to complain, so I didn't do it. But now that I get a chance, I'll do it. <laughs> it would be great, from my perspective at least, uh, if every C file was an independent compilation unit. And uh, some of these C files, if you try to open them with ClangD, you find that they don't pass because they are never compiled independently. They are meant to be included from a broader context. So, yeah, in a lot of time, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry.